Um, Eden mentioned it before, Rako bullet shearwaters, um, a species in crisis, question mark. Um, a little bit of background about the bird. They are known to be breeding only on the Pornites Islands. Uh, there was one record of uh, a breeding pair up on an island off uh, the far north. Um, but aside from that, the whole population, as far as we know... Sorry, I just need to interrupt just for a second. In about three or four minutes' time, a cannon's going to go off outside. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> just so you all know, you don't need to dash for the exit. Excuse me. And I'll duck. <laughs> Right. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> um, but just, just, you know, about the Poor Knights Islands, just to paint a picture about, um, about the history of the islands, they've had no invasive predators except for feral pigs, and the feral pigs were only on one island. So Poor Knights, a group of islands, two main islands, Aorangi and Tafirirahi. There's a number of small islands around, around there as well. Pigs were on... Um, uh, Aorangi only. Uh, the islands were settled over a long period of time, um, <coughs> highly modified despite their wonderful appearance today, um, and that would have had an impact on bullish shearwater populations. Okay. Historically, there have been a number of estimates um, given to the population size of bullish shearwaters. Um, back in 1938, the population of Aorangi was had been just pretty well wiped out by, by, by pigs. And um, two people, Buddle and Fleming, um, were on the island and found only about 100 burrows um, in an accessible cliff edge. And there might have been more on, on, on very steep ground where the pigs couldn't get to. On Tafiti Rahi, um, they didn't go, but, um, and, and, and there were no pigs there, but the population was believed to be around about 500,000 birds. And that's an estimate in 1959 um, from, from Wilson. Um, in the 60s and 70s, um, Sandy Bartle, Peter Harper, um, came up with estimated population for Aorangi of around about 200,000 pairs. Um, and so that's, that's a inc definite increase. You know, the, the pigs were wiped out in the 19, 1930s. So the population certainly increased on Aorangi from that 100 pairs right up to what they estimate as being 200,000 pairs. Um, and around about that time, a, a population estimate was given for the species of 2.5 million birds. Now that was mostly based on sightings at sea, you know, seeing these big rafts of birds, uh, big flocks of birds feeding off um, throughout the Hauraki Gulf but also up the northern coast. Then in 2011 to 2013, Graham Taylor, GT, um, was on Aorangi doing a little bit of tracking and looking at bullish shearwaters. And they did some quick transects and came up with a figure of fewer than 100,000 pairs um, for that island. So that was less than that estimate for 1981. And bullish shearwaters are considered vulnerable, um, but with a stable population, um, it, it, as far as IUCN is, it red list goes. But you can see we've got these highly variable figures for, for bullish shearwaters. So what was happening? Um, you know, were these gross uh, overestimates, um, you know, based on, on um, well, basically just guesstimates? So not only that, but Graham, with his tracking, found that um, the foraging times uh, during incubation of breeding bullish shearwaters may have increased in the past 40 years. So he was comparing it to work that um, Harper did. Harper was mainly working on fairy prawns on, on the poor nights, but he also studied the bullish shearwaters to some extent. And he was looking at uh, the provisioning times for chicks as being, you know, sort of on the average amount of about four days. Graham's found that the birds were uh, taking up to 14 days. And his tracking showed that they were making some considerable distances during what's called pre-lay, which is when the, um, just prior to obviously laying the eggs, generally that the females make these big journeys offshore or, or for long periods to 
essentially grow an egg, if you like. Um, and the males are doing similar things. But, and also during incubation, they were still making these big journeys. You can see in that little graphic down there, they're heading down to the Chathams and so on. So his suggestion was that maybe, you know, we've got, we've got an issue here. These birds are sort of um, uh, spending longer at sea than previously and uh, making these big journeys, um, you know, uh, also, it was tied in with, with a very poor breeding season that he found in the two years, two seasons he was there. Um, so what was going on? Um, he felt that maybe the population is under stress and, um, you know, maybe the population is declining or whatever. So that instigated a population survey, 2016, 2018. And I have to acknowledge Megan Friesen, who would have loved to have been here, and I would have loved her to be here, giving this presentation, not me. Um, but she led the, uh, the project. She was finishing her uh, PhD at Auckland. Um, and she did this as an add-on um, project for us. Um, supported by Birds New Zealand for, for funding. So it was a very intensive... Um, right, I'll duck. <laughs> Is it going to go? So it was a very intensive um, field season, which uh, included two... Here it goes. I'm still alive. <laughs> yeah. Okay, included two parts um, to quantify populations, and the other one was to quantify breeding success. So, um, the population model was to establish um, an estimate of the breeding pairs, um, transects for burrow occupancy. These were there were ten transects per island um, on the two main islands. And they were primarily over ridge lines. Uh, they were 150 metres in length. And at every 50 metres, the team would um, stop and take measurements of burrow occupancy and, and so on. Um, they also collected data on habitat, um, sort of topography, canopy, elevation, vegetation, slope, and so on. Um, and then there were some uh, a number of uh, burrow density plots set up prior to leaving on the trip. Uh, um, yeah. They also set out um, a number of acoustic recorders to try and get sort of differences between the areas on the island as well. So it was using a um, similar method to what uh, Matt Rayner had used with his Cook, Cook's petrol study on Halturu. Um, and it was to <coughs> use habitat variables and you know sort of uh, discovered by researchers on the ground and using maps to overlay the prediction of habitat used by the species across two main islands. So note that the maps show locations of transects, uh, the black lines, um, three meter plots shown in various sizes. So these are three meter diameter plots, uh, sorry three meter radius plots. Um, and the different sizes are the number of burrows in each of those plots. Now, what surprised us about, um, particularly Tafiti Rahi, I mean, our Rangi researchers have spent quite a bit of time on there. And there are quite large areas of the island where there are no burrows, um, but very he heavily in um, dense burrows, certainly around the south, south side of our Rangi. With Tafiti Rahi, we were told, oh, never go there. It's just so heavily burrowed. It's, you know, you're just going to be trashing burrows left, right, and center. Um, stay off the island. Um, but in fact, we found a lot of the island, there are no burrows. Um, but what we did find is that in certain areas, there were these very uh, heavily burrowed um, patches, a little bit similar to what um, Biz was showing on, on, on with flesh-footed shearwaters, you know, so these um, patches around the island. So, breeding population estimate. This is breeding pairs, 61,000. This is for the whole island, or the, the whole two, two islands. 61,413 pairs. You know, the model was repeated 5,000 times. Um, 
one thing that wasn't included in the population estimate is the numbers of uh, non-breeding birds or unemployed birds. And we believe um, that figure, just based on observations that we've made on the islands, as being between maybe 50% or even 70% um, you know, of the population. It, it, relatively high. Um, so obviously that, that figure of 61,000 pairs would be in, inflated. But compare that to the 2.5 million <coughs> pairs in 1980s, that, you know, the estimates and so on, even Graham Taylor's figures. Um, so what's happening? Um, so, I mean, this figure is far lower than, than we expected. Has the, has the population crashed? Or rather have earlier estimates, and these, and they were estimates, uh, were far too high. And I think that's something that we need to look at in the future um, by repeating the study. Um, there were some caveats into, to that in the sense that um, you can see from the, from the map there the, the yellow areas are the most intensely burrowed areas that are close to um, the edge of plateau areas or on the steep ground. It could be that um, you know, some of the more inaccessible areas hold significant numbers of bull or shear waters that couldn't be included because it was just too dangerous to go there. But certainly we have a, a new figure to work from. Um, the two, well, in fact, the three seasons we've been working on, on the poor nights, the population is, well, the birds have been doing brilliantly. Um, you know, the chicks have been the, the very high breeding success, uh, very fat chicks. I think we've got a photograph of one coming up, of very, very fat chicks. Um, so the birds appear to be doing well, but you know, we've got a new figure that we can work from for the population of bullish shearwaters. So as I said, chick, chick, chick success, yeah, <laughs> fat chick. <laughs> was pretty high for, for these years and pretty similar to between the two islands. Um, and definitely needs to be repeated. We'll be back there, as Eden said, next week. Um, part of our time is going to be split with you know, supporting Eden with her work on ferry prions, but also continuing the work we're doing with, with bullet shearwaters. And we'll be back there over the next two years as well. So on the back of that survey work, um, we started to we, we set up a, a a diet study, and this is with um, a lot of support from Kathy Mitchell, um, Eden, and and also Jinjing Zhang, who's been brought in for the for the modelling that we're doing from from the foraging studies. So this is work that we've um, done. So in terms of diet, uh, bullet shearwaters, and in terms of foraging, bullet shearwaters are something of an enigma because. Early in the season, you, you see them in massive numbers feeding around Trevally, Kawai, and mackerel schools. You know these these huge flocks. Um, but come February or late January, February through to April, they can be spread right along the northern coast, uh, following more uh, following tuna schools as opposed to you know around the mackerel school or around those uh, Trevally schools. So it's a, it's a real shift in in in, in what they're not so much what they're feeding off, but how they're feeding. The regurgitations that we've got from them have revealed krill, squid, and fish. But as Kathy knows and Eden knows, these birds are, are most reluctant regurgitators. They, they, they gave us very little. Foraging journeys. Um, GPS loggers were deployed earlier this year in March, April. This was during chick rearing. So, as I said, you know, very good breeding uh, breeding season. We deployed uh, 24 uh, GPS loggers um, in late March. 14 of those were retrieved. <coughs> um, the loggers set to provide fixes of 10 and 20 minutes. Um, they're extremely accurate. You know, within five meters. So, where were the birds going? Well, that's the data we received back from those 14, 14 loggers. Two of them actually were waterlogged, got, got water in them, so we got very short distances from them. But as you can see, this is the Channel Islands down, this is 1,000 kilometres. So two of these birds went 2,750 kilometres away, that way, towards South America on a foraging journey of several days. 
Two of those birds, they left the colony at the different times, but they ended up in the same spot on the same day, pretty much together, um, right down there, miles and miles and miles away. Um, there must be something really rich in terms of um, you know, food down that area. But what's going on? I mean, what we also found, and um, Biz has alluded to, or touched on this, is that the birds were splitting their, their time away from the colony. So they were making these very long journeys, but they were also doing very short trips as well. And you know, there is this sort of dual foraging strategy that these birds do take during chick rearing, which is to do short trips, provision the chick, and then go and look after themselves over these long, long trips. Maybe it's just they're sick of the kids and want to get out for a few days, you know. Just, um, but basically, you know, this is, this is becoming a clear pattern that we want to continue working with over the next couple of seasons. Um, at the same time, taking bloods and, um, you know, to look at stable isotopes. So bloods are taken on deployment of the loggers and on retrieval of the loggers. So we're looking at what these birds are feeding on as well, at least in terms of, of tropic, layer and tropic layers. Um, what were the birds doing? Um, you know, the, these tracks can be broken down, as we've seen, into um, commuting. So the green on those tracks is, is birds commuting, and they're kicking along at a hell of a speed. Um, you know, that's 2,500 kilometres in one direction on, the, on that one there. And um, those are only 20 minute intervals between those two, you know, between those points. So green is uh, commuting, resting is the sort of orange, orange ones, which are quite hard to see on that scale. And blue is basically birds actively foraging. Um, we're also looking at post breeding migration. So this is attaching the GLSs that uh, Biz talked about. Um, so 13 of geolocators were deployed in April 2019, well, earlier this year. We've retrieved nine of them in a trip in um, September, October, and, and also in November. Um, and we'll be looking for more of these when we get back uh, next week. Um, we've done no analysis on those at the moment, but what we're looking at is we're, we're collecting feather and blood samples from these birds. Um, so that's for stable isotope, but also, as you know, Brendan has mentioned, um, looking at their condition on return. Because there are things, or well, things have been happening in the North Pacific um, that have raised alarm bells, particularly amongst shearwater populations, um, mainly around short-tailed shearwaters that are breed in Australia. The huge die-off um, right up in the Bering Sea. These birds, short-tailed shearwaters, go the furthest north. And um, there have been huge die-offs of those birds there and very poor return of birds coming back to Australia to breed. Um, we don't believe we're getting this with bullish shearwaters. Birds returning see, appeared to be in very healthy condition. Um, the weights were actually quite a bit higher on average than when they left, but that just might be a normal thing. Um, so we're looking at, at, at the condition of these birds when they return. So. The future work with, with RACO, Bullish Shearwaters, um, we will repeat that population survey um, in probably five years' time. Um, but over the next two years, um, we're looking at birds returning from migration, so that's retrieving those GLSs or geolocators from the birds, following those birds through the season, uh, deploying more at the end, of the, the end of the season. We're looking at breeding success. Um, so our next trip on to the poor nights, we're going to be, well, we, we work with um, three plots or three colonies, if you like, on the island, and we've marked all the burrows. So there's you know, a sort of 10 by 8 metre plot, you've got about 60 or 50 burrows. And so they're all marked, we'll go back next week, we'll check to see how many have got incubating birds in. We'll go back in February, we'll see how many of those have got chicks in, and then we'll follow those chicks through to the end of the season. Um, so we're looking at diet through blood, feathers, um, stable isotopes. Uh, we'll be doing some regurgitations from birds um, to see if we can pick up some more obvious um, sign of what they're eating. And um, obviously the, the GPS tracking will continue to look at their foraging areas. Um, 
so yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, I'd like to point out the artwork down the left-hand side is by Abby McBride. She was a, a National Geographic um, sketch biologist that came over here and worked with us for, for a, uh, a year. So uh, this is thermal imaging um, of birds coming in at just after dusk. Um, Thermal imaging is, is great in the sense that you know, you're picking up on the heat of the bird. Um, you've got two modes. You, either you can make the birds or you know, the, the animals white hot or black hot. These are black hot. Um, so a species in crisis? Well, question mark. From what we have seen in the last three, three years, the population appears to be in good health, at least in terms of breeding success. There are large areas on both islands, both the main islands and the poor nights, where the birds could continue to expand. However, this is a species we believe is worth monitoring because of what could be happening within the result, with the resources that these birds depend on. And I'm going to touch on these in a, in a presentation um, this afternoon. So thank you. That's my presentation. I'd just like to, you know, thank. Um, you've, got, you've got the acknowledgements there. Um, Dive to Kaka have been amazing in terms of um, uh, their support. These trips, the field work, we, we spend a lot of time on these islands. We go across quite a lot. Um, without their support, these would be very expensive islands to visit. We get it for free. It's brilliant. All those boat transfers. Doc and Fong Array have been absolutely brilliant in supporting us. Graham Taylor, Choice Taylor. Uh, Birds New Zealand Research Fund have um, given us a lot of support over the years. University of Auckland, obviously, and uh, Ngati Wai um, for the privilege of actually working on these islands. So, thank you. <laughs>